Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to support the inaugural conference of the Jeffrey Chia Institute. I must, of course, thank the many speakers who have kindly agreed to come and speak at this uh, uh, event. I am going to expand on some of the themes that Professor Dwight Perkins had talked about earlier. I would like to record that I'm a student of Professor Dwight Perkins, and my hope is that when he hears my presentation, the words of Paul Simon would not ring in his head, saying, my words come back to me in shades of mediocrity. <laughs> so I, I sometimes I wish I could be a better reflection of my teacher. The organization of my remarks is first, I will take a broader look than what Professor Perkins did. He looks at Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia. What I'm going to do is to take a more global view of it. And having seen what the global picture can be summed up as, what is the right analogy to think about the growth process? I'm going to suggest that a heuristic analogy would be that of a moving car. And on the basis of the analogy, what are the lessons we can draw from Malaysia and what are the lessons we can draw for China, if we have time for them. So let's look at what do we mean by high income, middle income, low income. Clearly, you have some idea of if you rank all the countries by their GDP per capita, their income, you can have a cut off line at different levels. But where you cut off uh, the separate high from middle and middle from, from uh, low, really depends on what's the question you are asking. In other words, where you draw the line that separates one category from the other depends on the question you're asking. The World Bank makes the demarcation so as to be able to decide how much concession it should give in its loans to the different countries. So in a sense, they look at their budget and then they, they decide what is the degree of concession in their loans. And there are many ways of measuring income. The one we should do is commonly called the PPP measure, which means it measures the standard of living in a country. And with respect to a reference country, which is usually the US case. The question that I want to ask in drawing the line of high income, low income, and middle income is, is the country converging to the living standard of the global economic leader? In other words, I'm focused on the question of catching up. Are you catching up or are you not catching up to the highest standard of living that is available? Because after all, if you look at the World Bank's line, they give a certain level of income, you find that their line is revised upward over time anyway. Why do they revise it upward? Because the level of living of the economic leader has gone up over time. So the first thing we want to think of is what I call a catch-up index. The catch-up index is merely the ratio of the income of the country divided by the income of the United States, the economic leader of the last century. So having drawn that particular, uh, defined that ratio, we can start drawing lines. How should we draw lines? One way is, let's look at the experience of the five economies in each region. So we take the five largest economies in each region. In the case of this is Europe. This tells you how the catch-up ratio of the five largest European countries has changed from 1962 to 2010. 
what we do see is that it goes up and it goes down. There are two things you should notice. One is that these countries are becoming more and more like each other. The range at the 1960 spans from 57 to roughly 80. By 2010, the range is much smaller. They are all at a much similar level of catch-up to the United States. The average at the beginning of 1960 is 70%. The average in 2010 is roughly 70%. They have caught up and they keep on being up there with the US a distance of 70%. And why is it 70% instead of 100? Because this is GDP per capita and the Europeans take more holidays than the that the Americans and the Europeans have an older population, so a smaller proportion of population is working compared with the United States. That's why 70%, but output per hour worked is the same. They are just as productive as Americans when it is output per hour, but 70% is catching up. This is the picture of countries that have caught up. Let's look at the picture that led me us to talk about middle income trap. Look at this for the five largest Latin American countries. Over time, they have become more similar too. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, the range in 1960 was from around 45% to 20%. 60 years, 50 years later, the range is much narrower, 20 to 40. But the average is roughly 30%. So they began at 30% and they end up at 30%. In other words, the gap if the US never was, was closed. It never went up anywhere near 70%. This is what we mean by the middle income trap. It's a true phenomenon, but the, what we, is at dispute are the mechanisms that could cause this kind of stagnation. So the first concept in talking about the middle income is a technical term known as club convergence, which is basically in any given region, the largest economies in that region become more and more like each other in terms of level of income. The Western Europeans are all getting closer and closer to 70% of the US. If you began at 80, you move to 70. If you began at 60, you move to 70. And in Latin America, it's roughly 30%. So what we do see in the real world is club convergence in regions. This is why Latin America is described as being in the middle income trap. Question, is East Asia different? And this was what Dwight's uh, exposition, uh, analysis was on. What I have done is I've taken the six largest countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, the six largest developing countries. So I took out Japan, took out South Korea, took out Taiwan province, and plot on China, India, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia. As you could see on the map, there are some countries that kind of change, don't change very much, like for example, the chocolate line is Philippines. Philippines went from 12% of US living standard to 10 to 8% of US living standard. The more things change, the more they remain the same in the case of the Philippines. But there are two countries that clearly have been moving up in terms of closing the gap with the United States. The top country, we should all be proud to acknowledge, is Malaysia. The second country be below that is uh, Thailand. These are the two star performers. And then you see that blue line which started off at the very, very bottom in 1960 and has become number three in 2010, that is China. China basically uh, was a bottom dweller up until after 78 and then it starts moving up rapidly from 5% of US living standard to almost 20% of US living standard. This is 
gives us the sense. This is why the World Bank calls Malaysia, Thailand, the miracle economies, the growth that gives us such great pride. But happiness, unfortunately, many times comes from having low standards. <laughs> because, well, actually, that was how I've been told. That's the secret of happiness. <laughs> the scale of this is from 0 to 35. Remember, the Europeans were 70. Let us put the two best performers, Malaysia and Thailand, together with the Northeast neighbors that did do well. The one at the very top is Japan. Japan, as you could see, started in 1960, roughly at 40%. By the time the Tokyo Olympics, it was quite clearly nearly at 50. It continues growing, hits 80, and today it is roughly slightly over 70. That's why we know that there's been no revolution in Japan despite this so-called stagflation, stagnation largely because GDP per capita continues to grow as much as it does in Western Europe and the United States. They are no worse off than the Europeans. They're still at 70%. The chocolate line is Taiwan. The third line is South Korea. Green line is Malaysia. And below that is Thailand. On this scale, you really see what perform Malaysia's real performance is. After hitting a, a, a peak in 1994, Malaysia has basically flattened out. 20 years ago, we were 30% of US level. Today, we are 20% of US level, 30%. We are just like where the Latin Americans are. Only that, we have been there only 20 years. The Latin Americans have been there 50 years. So to say that we are not in the middle income trap would be a denial of what these numbers have shown. So having talked about what the facts are, I'd like to propose a heuristic uh, framework to think of how you think of the growth process, what are the things that could go wrong, a car that is moving, why is it not moving any faster, or why has it crashed? We use the language of this generation, the IT language, the first type of failure you can think of in a car is what I call hardware failure. A basic, and then the soft, second type would be a software failure. And how do we relate that to analytical social sciences? Well, in the social sciences, we are told there's something called a base structure, that's what economics study, and then there's a superstructure, that's what politics and sociology and culture is all about. And then, that's the big picture, which is what is powering the system. There's a power supply, and that is what we call the sustainability, uh, uh, sustainable development. Hardware failure would be a failure in an economic mechanism, a failure in economic policy, a failure in economic incentives. Software failure, the car crash because there's people fighting inside the car. They don't like the direction that the car is going. They don't like the way it is being driven. So because of social instability, growth comes to a standstill. So corruption, incompetence are examples of what I call software failure. The third type of power supply failure is like a car running out of gas or a car that does not have the power to crash through a barrier. Running out of gas would be like running out of water. You cannot grow if there's no water. If there is to be water rationing five days a week, I think the Malaysian GDP growth rate would register a downward dip. And the other one is, you hit a roadblock. That would be like trade sanctions. Iran is brought to its feet right now because it's facing a trade ten, uh, economic trade uh, sanctions. So these are the three types of failure. And how do we think about their contributions to growth and what kind of uh, useful conclusions we can draw about the implications of the middle income trap? 
I think we have to recognize that these three types of failures I talk about are interactive in nature. I like the opening line of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. He says, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So if you are taking the GRE or the SAT and you were asked to translate that sentence and you're given the choice, is happiness the result of factor one plus factor two plus factor three? In other words, are three things that makes you happy. Are they additive in nature? Or are they interactive or multiplicative in nature? That means that if it is choice A, that means that if, 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 X, if you don't have X2, you don't have X3, but you just have a lot of X1, you'll do okay. Whereas the other statement is, if any one of them is missing, you are finished. Basically, the three of them works as a system. In the short run, it is possible to have equation A to be the growth driver, but in the long run, it's multiplicative. The Soviet Union grew very fast from 1920 to 1966, first country to send people to space. It was all driven by heavy investment, but it didn't have a market economy. And what happened? It's not here today. The US, having got the right hardware, which is lots of investment, the right software, which is the market system, and the uh, political social uh, institutions that support the growth is still around. So what the real implication is when there, a country is in a middle income trap, it could be there for a different reason for each country. And the role of JCI is to figure out what is the factor in each of the Southeast Asian countries that could potentially keep it in the middle income trap. In the case of Malaysia, I would argue that it has to do with the failure to fully mobilize the population for national development. This failure to mobilize the population has to do with the outdatedness of the economic policy regime that was adopted in 1970 and is still continued to today. Basically, the world has changed, Malaysia has changed, what worked in the past does not work now. That is why when the people designed the policy in 1970, they say you've got to revisit the whole question in 1990. Largely because what we know we are doing is good short-run policy, but we are not so sure there is good long-run policy. And I will explain to you why I think we are where we are. After the Asian financial crisis, we bounced back full of optimism in the future. Mahathil, in his report in 2001, predicted that economic growth in the next 10 years, 20, 2001 to 2010, would average 7.5% a year. Basically, Malaysia would certainly average that in the 1990s if there were no Asian financial crisis. He thinks of the growth as coming. If you look at the 7.5, it is the sum of contributions from the different factors pushing the economy forward. The growth in the labor force, investment growth, and the other one is technological improvements. Tun Mahathir clearly believes we are on the transition, su successful transition to a knowledge-based economy. That's why our TFP, which is technology uh, component, would jump from 0.9 in the 1970s, 1970, 1990, to 3.2. That is what you mean by knowledge-based growth. That's what he expects to happen. Malaysia would be driven along mostly by knowledge-led growth. And the important assumption was that if you look at investment as a share of GDP, investment fell during the Asian financial crisis. 
But after the crisis is whole, over, things return back to normal, and with things normal, investment would jump to 28 points percent of GDP. So investment would go back to where it was. It's true that uh, the labor force growth would be slower, but technological improvements will be driving growth in Malaysia. That's the vision in 2010, 2001, at the beginning of the millennium. Well, high hopes we had, but unfortunately, the performance has been roughly half of what we had expected. Not only in comparison to the plan, but also in comparison with the period of growth in the 10 years before the Asian financial crisis. From 9.4, we fell to 4.5 in the first five years, and a 4.2 in the next five years. Of course, that's why politics is unraveling in Malaysia. Growth has slowed down, and people feel a sense of that something. There must be some way better uh, to, to run things. So, and why is it that the growth rate has slowed in Malaysia? The reason we have slowed in Malaysia is because growth is driven by three things. Increase in population, increase in the capital stock, and an increase in the level of technology. Malaysia has suffered a big collapse in private investment beginning around 2000. Private investment used to be 21% of GDP or 33% of GDP. But in the 2005 to 2010 period, roughly in private investment is now one third to half of what it used to be. There's been a collapse in private investment in Malaysia. The government has tried to keep the economy up by boosting up uh, public investment. Let me quickly add that what is private investment in Malaysia? Private investment in Malaysia is foreign direct investment plus investment by GLCs, Kazana, Saimdabi, Petronas, and the third is domestic, private, truly private investment. And why has private investment collapsed? Private investment has collapsed because the world has changed on Malaysia. Ever since the policy of uh, national, uh, new economic policy of 1970, there has been an increasing acceleration of capital flight from Malaysia and brain drain from Malaysia. One would have expected, given the brain drain and the capital flight, growth would be low. But not at all, we grew at 9% despite the capital flight, despite the brain drain. Why was that possible? That was possible because 1970 coincided with the product cycle coming into operations. The relocation of production from the traditional industrial sectors to Malaysia. So domestic capital runs out, foreign capital comes in. Domestic brain power flows out, foreign engineers came in. So in other words, water came out from the top, but there was an inflow of FDI. And all of this was able to offset the negative effects of the NEP on private capital and human capital accumulation. For the, we were saved by globalization. By globalization, took a turn that was surprising to us, China became, removed itself from isolation, and China joined WTO, successfully completed negotiations in 2000. In the old days, when you put something in China, you also put something in Malaysia. Why? Because China had, needs MFN approval every year before it could export to the United States. Once China had guaranteed access to the European and US market, there was no need to diversify your risk by putting your foreign direct investment in Malaysia anymore. So, the inflow of water into the tap no longer comes to make up for the outflow in the tap. I'll quickly wind up 
So basically, why we, in order to keep growing, we have to prevent private in investment from staying at such a low level. And we have to prevent the outflow of the human capital of this country. The World Bank has shown that 20% of our university graduates leave the country. We may have high quality education, but it's not staying here as much. So clearly, we need to mobilize the country fully so that domestic capital will stay, domestic brain power will stay, and that would then allow us to uh, get out of the middle income trap. Uh, well, I think that, of course, that's not the only reason. 30 more seconds and I'll be done. As when something bad happens, there's usually more than one reason for it. Clearly, the NEP is the reason now, in, and it was not, we could not see the negative effects before 2000 because the FDI was coming in. Now the FDI is not coming in, we see the negative effects. But over time, there are other things wrong. One of them would be decent over-centralization of, of uh, the government, uh, of administration in Malaysia. Every bus line in Penang is de decided in Putrajaya. Every bus stop on that bus line is decided in Putrajaya. This over-centralization is seen in the revenue. The state government has no money to build infrastructure to support local industries. University Science Malaysia has a bigger budget than the Penang state government. How could you build any infrastructure to support local industries? This is another aspect, independence of NEP, that needs to be corrected. There are other things that need to be corrected, but uh, we, I would love to hear your reaction to the analysis given by my two esteemed predecessors. Thank you.